sure the Venom movie's tagline is the world has enough superheroes. But sure the Venom movie Sure the Venom movie's tagline is the world has enough superheroes. Sure, the Venom movie's tagline is the world has enough superheroes because this powerful alien symbiote appears to be an evil man-eating menace. But have you ever stopped to consider that Venom may actually be the victim in all of this? Give me 15 minutes, or honestly whatever length this video winds up being because who knows, the actual length of this video isn't finalized until like five steps after I record this. Whatever it winds up being, stick around because I think I'm gonna be able to change your mind. Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, the show that's cringier than a Peter Parker dance break. Okay, maybe not that cringy, but close. Today we're talking about Venom, one of Spider-Man's most popular villains because, let's face it, who doesn't love themselves a dark doppelganger storyline, am I right? For those of you who need the quick rundown, Venom is one of several alien symbiotes to go around possessing human hosts in the Spider-Verse, giving them special abilities like shape-shifting, increased strength, and, um, abnormally long tongues. In the new movie, journalist Eddie Brock is investigating the Life Foundation, an organization whose experiments with the symbiotes are a whole lot more sinister than their super generic name implies. When the investigation goes awry, Eddie's body merges with the symbiote, unleashing Venom, and his ultimate ability, awkward one-liners. In all seriousness, though, there's an interesting side to Venom that no one has ever really stopped to consider, that he's the victim in all of this. And I don't mean that in the big, bad, evil science corporation did experiments on him or anything like that. I mean that for all the death and destruction that Venom may bring, the symbiote is really just a lost, confused, and scared entity. And that Eddie Brock might be the thing that's actually infecting it. But to truly understand why, we first have to understand the nature of parasites. You see, let's just strip away all the alien goo nonsense. Venom is the dictionary definition of a parasite. An organism that lives in or on another organism, its host, and derives nutrients at the host's expense. Take, for instance, the case of the parasitic wasp and the orb-weaving spider, both of which live in Japan. The female wasp drops her eggs onto the back of the spider, which hatch and then become a larva. In larval form, the baby wasp takes control over the spider, causing it to build a web. A web that is nearly three times stronger than any web the spider would ever build for itself in its normal life. It sounds a lot like Venom, and that increased strength he gives to his host bodies. This feels good. It amplifies characteristics of its host. The reason they do this is that the larva will soon be helpless in a cocoon, and needs a stronger web to protect it. A web that's heavier duty than what a spider would typically build. Once that web is built, the spider host is killed off. It's no longer useful. Always about that web bam, thank you, ma'am. But for as similar as a spider parasite might be to Venom, there's actually a better fit when it comes to the real Cisbondii, which I've talked about very briefly years ago in one of the earliest and cringiest episodes of Game Theory. <laughs> That worked. Basically, toxoplasmosis hijacks the brain of a rat, forcing it to hide out in the open where it can be found and eaten by cats. Bad news for the rat, but great news for the parasite, because once it's inside the cat's stomach, it can morph into a cat-compatible form and then also reproduce inside the cat's digestive system. After reproducing, it gets pooped back out by the cat and gets into the water supply, where it's once again consumed by it's like a really gross version of the circle of life. Everything that poop touches will be your home. Now, you'd be totally forgiven if none of that immediately reminds you of Venom, but in both cases we're presented with a parasite whose behavior and abilities change based on the thing it's infecting. Symbiotes affect Peter Parker and Eddie Brock and Cletus Cassidy very differently, just like toxoplasmosis changes tactics depending on whether it's inside of a cat or inside of a rat or even inside of a human. You see, toxoplasmosis can also affect humans. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to cause you to 
ate down a Mr. Fluffy's food dish in the hopes of him one day eating you, but studies have shown that this could have other effects on the human brain. Specifically, it might be linked to an increased risk of schizophrenia. According to researchers at the Stanley Medical Research Institute, quote, cat ownership in childhood has now been reported in three studies to be significantly more common in families in which their child is later diagnosed with schizophrenia or another serious mental illness, end quote. Furthermore, the researchers finding, quote again, suggests that cat ownership in childhood is significantly more common in families in which the child later becomes seriously mentally ill, end quote. Further stating that an explanatory mechanism may be so plasma gone the eye. Now, before everyone rushes off to put Mr. Fluffy up for adoption, I'd like to point out that there are more than 40 million people in the U.S. who are currently suspected to be infected with the toxoplasmosis parasite, and only a teeny tiny fraction of those are diagnosed with full-blown schizophrenia. Even if the link between the two is scientifically valid, and remember, it is far from certainty, the chances of getting a schizophrenia diagnosis are still incredible. Incredibly low. Just try to be hygienic and make sure that you're washing your hands after you empty the litter box. You're doing that, right? R right? Anyway, the link between toxoplasma and schizophrenia is really interesting because in a lot of ways it parallels Eddie Brock's relationship with the venom parasite. For instance, one of the main symptoms of both schizophrenia and the symbiote is psychosis, a failure to understand reality and a higher propensity for hallucinations. And this is something that is immediately apparent from the trailer of the new movie. In that trailer, Eddie looks for a car window and sees the reflection of venom staring back at him. This should be physically impossible. The shot is showing us things as Eddie sees them. In this case, he's seeing things that aren't really there. Eddie is also prone to auditory hallucinations, hearing a voice call his name. Eddie. Venom's voice commending him. Etc. Now wait, I hear you saying that isn't a hallucination. Venom is literally talking to him. And sure, that's true, but it's all still happening in his head. That conversation with Venom is the textbook so definition of auditory hallucinations. And one of the clearest signs that Eddie might be headed off to schizophrenia. But why does any of this matter? I mean, sure, venom and toxoplasmosis might share some similarities, but even I, with my over-the-top theories, won't go so far as to say that the symbiote is just a hyper-evolved form of this cat parasite. I don't need another Deadpool as Ernest Hemingway moment on my hands. No, the reason I bring up the parallels here is that whether we're talking about parasitic wasps, parasites that warp rat brains, or fictional alien parasites, one thing connects all of them. A need Need for survival. It's easy to forget, but parasites are fighting for survival just like any other living creature. And they're using whatever techniques that they have at their disposal. It's why the wasp gets the spider to build a stronger web, so it can reproduce. It's why toxoplasma forces the rat to get eaten, so it can reproduce inside of the cat's stomach. But now, take a moment to look at Venom's behavior. We see him presumably eat a guy in the middle of the convenience store, and then just leave a witness. If you need to eat a human to survive, why wouldn't you just track down victims in, uh, I don't know, dark, secluded alleyways instead of, I don't know, the middle of the street where six people, yes, six people, count them, are watching, one of whom appears to be recording the whole thing on a cell phone. Behaviors like this result in Eddie, and by proxy Venom, repeatedly getting attacked by thugs, having to run away, having to fight for their lives. In Spider-Man 3, Venom being evil gets himself the worst enemy possible, Spider-Man. Anyway, you slice it, this behavior is simply not conducive to helping Venom survive. It is instead doing the exact opposite and putting him at active risk. So what is really going on here? Well, it's all explained by Dr. Plasmosis. You see, changing rats' behavior so that they get eaten by cats helps the toxoplasma survive and reproduce. Inducing psychosis in humans, however, does none of those things. It is a loss for the human, who starts to develop mental issues, but it's also a loss for the toxoplasma, who can't move on from the human to the cat's digestive tract and reproduce because, well, there just aren't that many man-eating cats out there. The problem is Toxoplasma didn't evolve to exist in humans. It evolved for the cat-rat style of life. The fact that it also happens to affect humans is entirely accidental, an unintended side effect. 
This relates to a field called zoonosis, infectious diseases that begin in animals but can eventually be transmitted into humans, like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, probably better known as mad cow disease. There's a bird flu, and probably the single most notorious example in history, the Black Death in 14th century Europe, which was spread by rat fleas that went on to kill human hosts. One of the reasons that these kinds of diseases can be so fatal to humans is that they didn't evolve to affect humans. They evolved to affect some other animal. And the fact that they can infect and kill humans is just the accidental side effect, which is usually a pretty bad evolutionary strategy if you're a parasite. But this is what seems to be happening in the case of the symbiotes. We're so used to seeing venom in other symbiotes, like carnage and scream attaching to human hosts, that you might make the mistake of assuming that the symbiotes naturally exist to bond with humans. But that's not the case at all. Canonically speaking, the symbiotes were originally created by the primordial deity Null in order to slaughter the Celestials, basically space gods from the beginning of time. You remember Nowhere from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies? How it's in the shape of a head? Well, yeah, in the comics, that's technically a Celestial's severed head where people are parking their boats. Anyway, it shouldn't come as a big surprise that an organism created in a separate part of the galaxy with the intent of bonding with space Jizai would probably experience unintended side effects when trying to bond with a human host. It's a learning process, which might explain why Venom's behavior sometimes seems erratic at best, and completely against his own survival at worst. In fact, if anything, it might be the symbiotes themselves who are affected more by this bonding process. We often see the Venom symbiote as something who takes control of humans, but the link works both ways. Though the symbiotes were originally created with evil intentions, one of the quirks of their programming is that they take on some attributes of their hopes. In many cases, symbiotes feel that their existence has no meaning, and one of the reasons they bond with the host is to give their lives a simple purpose. This is one of the reasons why when Venom first bonded with Peter Parker in the comics, the thing it did was to go out at night and fight crime. The meaning for its own existence came from Peter Parker, who spent most of his time fighting crime. However, this had an unintended side effect. The symbiotes who had bonded with benevolent hosts infected the symbiotic hive mind with traits such as nobility and honor. The good symbiotes eventually rebelled against Null and imprisoned him at the center of their artificial planet in the Andromeda Galaxy, eventually creating the agents of the cosmos as a force not of chaos, but for good. If you needed proof that symbiotes weren't designed with humans in mind, that seems like a pretty good indicator. The fact that no humans were actually able to reprogram an evil alien symbiote hive mind to be benevolent seems to indicate that symbiotes are not prepared for the effects of what happens when they bond with a completely new organism, in this case, a human. Whether that meant turning over a new leaf and rebelling against their evil creator, or simply threatening to eat a dude in the middle of the street, turning him into a Venom is on an unfamiliar planet fighting for his own survival, and one of the only weapons he has at his disposal is imperfect mankind. He's scared, he's threatened, and he's doing his best to survive.